Matthew chapter 19, verse 1, the verse is on the screens. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to there and follow along with us as well. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him and tested him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, at the, beginning of the, at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permit you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciple says to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word but only those whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. The word of the Lord. Amen? Please be seated. Like I said, I was hoping I wouldn't last as a pastor long enough to cover these verses, but here we are. Should have given it to Caden. <laughs> Give it to the youth pastor. Let him mess it up, right? <laughs> what should I do? What can I do? Uh, am I doomed to eternal torture because, well, I'm divorced? Not me. I'm just telling you in third person. I'm happily married for 17 years, going more coming up. I'm, I'm, a, I'm remarried. I'm Married a divorced person, does this mean you who have made these decisions in the past or currently are doomed for the rest of your life? That God hates you and he is going to burn you in hell for eternity. Is that what's happening here? Is this what the Bible is saying? That you are committing adultery because you are in this situation? Well, there's no short answer. However, the Bible deserves careful study, and God's Word deserves careful prayer, and your heart tuning in to what God is saying, what Jesus is saying. What I want to do today is, first I want to explain the Scripture. What is it saying? How is Jesus going to tackle this question? And then, at the end, we will talk about what difference does it make in our lives. This is not a marriage sermon series. We have a series coming up after this on marriage leading into Christmas, so we will cover more marriage advice on that. But today, it's not about marriage advice. But today, let's look at the Scripture and look at what Jesus is saying. How is he going to tackle this? The first is that they, they came to Jesus with the question. Their purpose was to try to lessen Jesus' popularity. They're trying to lessen Jesus' popularity. Here's the question. Uh, if, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason. Notice, this is a very male-dominated question. All these people are following Jesus. They're looking at Jesus, male and females, and all of a sudden, this question proposes, Jesus, can we divorce a woman, a wife, for any reason, for any reason at all? I can imagine all the male in the crowd at that time standing there, yeah, Jesus, can we? <laughs> Please let us know. Can, 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 can we do this? Can, 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 can we divorce our wives for any reason? She doesn't cook anymore the way I met her. She was whipping up a meal when I come over her house on date nights. But now after marrying for a long time, she's just not doing it anymore. She doesn't clean like she used to. She, she's not rubbing my feet every night like we first got married. Can we? Can, she's not as exciting anymore. She gained some weight after a couple kids along the way. Can I, Jesus, can I just divorce my wife for any reason? 
I, I can see the men in the crowd standing there cheering the Pharisees on for asking that question. You know, she's not wearing that thing when we first met anymore. Like, where did that piece of clothing go? Okay, we'll stop there. That sermon is in October. Make sure you come back. Okay, but that's not the point of today. The question poses a conflict for Jesus because Moses had a law. To the Jewish people, Moses is a very important figure. He's the patriarch of their faith. If Jesus would disagree with the Pharisees, that means Jesus is a fraud because Jesus claims to come from God. And if you are a person who comes from God, then you have to honor Moses the way the Pharisees would honor Moses. If Jesus disagreed, therefore, he's a fraud. If Jesus agreed, then he would lose half of the people in the crowd because most of the people who followed Jesus at that time, and it's an uprising, were women. I say this before, and I say it all the time. Every woman in America should follow Jesus. He was the first public figure in history to raise you up, to say, no, you will not treat her that way. So here, they pose a question. Jesus, what are you going to do now? A lot of your followers are women. You claim to be from God. Are you going to honor the law of Moses, or are you going to agree with what we're saying? They're trying to split Jesus' followers in half. So Jesus answered the question, and then he says, then, uh, then why, did, why did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and sends her away? So here is the law. What does the law say? Let's look at the law. The words on the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her. The law is that if a man brings a woman home after he marries her and he finds something indecent, the idea of being indecent means he discovered that she was not a virgin anymore, that she had violated the law of God. How would a man know that? How would they find? I don't, I don't know how that works, right? But we're going to get to the, the spiritual side of it. But if he finds something displeasing, indecent about her, this is not about... Oh, she doesn't cook, she doesn't wear, she doesn't clean anymore. This is about her not being a virgin when, she, when he brings her home. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, next slide, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her to his house, or if he dies... Then the first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring this sin or bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Your attention, please. This is the law. You can't divorce your wife for any reason other than the reason of infidelity, like someone has violated the marriage law of being united, one flesh, together. You can't kick her out of the house. You, you have to write a certificate of divorce, and you can not take her back and remarry her. If you have change of heart and realize she's now a better wife to another man, maybe I made this mistake, and I wait for her to get divorced or whatever, and I can marry her back again. So this is the, the scenario here is that you cannot abuse a woman. The law and the idea is to protect the dignity of a woman. So that's the law. But you can divorce her for infidelity reasons. So the Jewish people were half right. However, they were so into their sins that they can just make up a story to divorce their wives. At any given moment, that's why Moses permitted. People were so evil, they were so far from God, that they begin to make up stories about the infidelity of their wives and divorce her for any reason. They, they come up with excuses to, uh, to move from women uh, to women. And as a male-dominant society would ask this question, can we divorce her, Jesus? 
So Jesus explained the law. This is his explanation. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Pastor New, what does this even mean? I have... I tell people all the time, they ask me, how's it going? What do you do? How's church going? I said, I do more marital counseling now than ever. From every stage of life, whether it's a long-time marry or a new marry or getting ready to be married. And some are even this poses a question. Can I marry someone who's already been married? Does that mean I'm committing sexual immorality or commit adultery? So Jesus says the divorce was not and ever a command from God. Moses gave permission for you to divorce. And when he gave you permission to divorce because your hearts were hard, he says, write a certificate to protect the dignity and her standing in society. So she can remarry again. The future for her is not lost. And I would take this a step further. There is something about writing something down. When Liz and I first met, we would fight all the time. We would fight so much that I don't even know what we were fighting about. <laughs> we just argue. We argue about everything. But part of the reason because I was a new Christian right? And also, we have culture differences. I don't know if you guys know or not, but I'm Asian. <laughs> it's obvious, right? I'm Asian. It's obvious. My wife is Caucasian. She get burned in the sun very easily at the beach. She grew up very differently than I am. In my household, male dominant. In her household, equal. That's a foreign idea to me when I first moved here to America. Enjoy the freedom you have in America. We fight all the time. We fight to the point that every time we fight, I go back to my dorm and she goes back to her dorm. And we would go to our counselor right away, the guy that ended up marrying us and, and, and my friend that we still talk all we talk to so many people when we were dating and i was willing to risk the conversation because i knew liz was the one that i wanted to bring home we work at a camp together didn't know he was going to be here today but tracy twaddell was the director of that camp and tracy do you remember how many times we go to Tracy's office and talk about relationships and marriage? And when we would fight, Liz was a lot wiser than I am, as God created women to be, our helper. When she says something, I would, I would just stop her and just snap at it. No, this is the way it is. So she stopped talking about it, and she writes it down. She write everything that she wanted to say, and she just gives it to me. And when I would sit there and I would read it, it calms me down because now I'm hearing what she's saying. And here's the trick, guys. Write it down. Moses took the law one step further. If you are angry at your wife, if you are just don't have the words to say anymore, and the only thing you can do is walk outside and you do nothing because that's what you end up doing. It's nothing because you're so mad. You have no idea what you're doing anymore. You're just doing nothing. Write it down. There's something about writing it down that calms you down and understanding what makes sense and what doesn't make sense because you're now writing it down. You're documenting. It's like, do I really feel this way about my wife? About the one I love? The one that I'm dating? The one that I brought home? The one that I wanted to bring home? Do I really feel this way? 
about her. And when you write this down, you realize our emotions <coughs> tricks us. Our emotions guide us, misguide us into how we feel. So, so I would take it one step further here. The reason Moses permitted them to divorce their wives, but in order to divorce your wife, to, have, to write it down because you are not going to divorce her out of anger. Men doesn't have anger issues, do we? Never. We all do. As your pastor? Yeah. It's in us. It's our sinful nature. We get angry. So, so Moses said, no, I want you to sit down, relax, write it down. So you are not hurting her. You are not putting her down. You are not pushing her out of your house. In the chaos of anger, potentially preventing him from just rashly divorcing her or, 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 or kicking her out or, or, or whatever annoyance she had. And you move from relationship to relationships. The command is from the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery. The purpose of the law was to protect the purity of relationships in the way God instituted. It, it, that's the purpose of the law. So, so Jesus explained God's desire for this union, for, for this marital relationship. He answered it in the way of Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? That's something we all should know culturally. And that's what the Bible said. And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. God intent for a marriage union. This is incredible to me. It's even stronger than a family ties. He says, you will leave your father and mother to be united with your wife. God is saying that your union with your wife is stronger than your relationship between you and your father and mother. That's how much God views this relationship. Now, I mentioned to you about the culture clash between Liz and I when we first met. I brought Liz home to meet my, my mom, a wonderful woman. Uh, but my mom was not happy. Simply because she wanted me to marry an Asian girl. My mom's not a racist. She just wanted her son to have an Asian girl. Because in her mind, the Asian culture, the wife does everything. She wants her son to be taken care of. Marry an Asian girl. She'll cook for you. She'll clean for you. She'll do dishes for you. She'll do your clothes. She'll take care of your kids. Why are you going to marry a white girl? That's the American culture. It's freedom. They're 50 fit or 100 100, right? Why would you do that? Don't you want to marry someone who's going to come home and just wash your feet? So she wasn't happy about that. So we had some things we worked through. And at the end of the day, I was very honest with my mom. And I said, I said, look, new I speak to her in Vietnamese, obviously. She doesn't understand English. But let me translate for you. If you don't like Liz because she's white, and that's not okay. But if you don't like Liz because you think that she won't serve me, then you're wrong. Listen to what I said to my mom. If you don't like Liz because she's white, that's not okay. But you don't like Liz because she's, you think she's not going to serve me the way you intended, then that's, that's not okay. That's wrong because you don't know. So I said, I'm going to be the one that's living with her, not you. So how she serves me, I'm okay with that. Because the ties between a man and a woman that's bring together in a union in marriage is stronger than the union between you and your parents. My advice for you this, guys and gals. When, when I first brought Liz home, the first month we had insurance issues. So she called her dad. She said, Dad, what, what do I do with, with insurance? I've always been on your insurance, and now we've got to get new insurance. What, what do I do? 
Her dad said something that, that was so profound and so wise of him, and he understood the scripture. He says, Liz, you have a husband now. Go talk to him. Ask him. Work through this together. My advice for you young people, work on your relationship with your spouse. Don't call your mom and dad for every little thing. Let him be in charge. Let her be in charge sometimes. You don't have to go to your parents for every. Figure it out yourself and do it together because that's how God instituted for the two of you to build the relationship together. So God uh, has this command, it's spiritual, that two people becomes together that create this strong bond that, you, that, that you honor her, you love her, you protect her, you lift her up. It's one of the ways we worship and we honor God. Divorce should never be a part of this union. Divorce should never be a part of your conversation. It's what God intended for a couple who decides that I'm going to marry you. Jesus is not interested in which reason are valid for divorce or valid enough, but he reminds us that marriage is, is an act of worship. And this is hard. This is not easy. I, I, I understand. This is, it's not easy for any of us to take in of this. The disciples said to him, if this situation is between a husband and a wife, it's better not to be married. So what you're hearing today is not any easier than the disciples standing there listening to Jesus 2,000 years ago. I said, Jesus, if this is the case, who can do this? It's better to just be the single for the rest of your life. And Jesus says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Some are called to be married. Some are not. Some can choose to be single for the rest of their lives. Whatever the situations you are in now, use it. Honor God. When it comes to the scripture, there are several non negotiable. And that's the Ten Commandments. Don't have other gods before me. Make no idols. Don't dishonor my name. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. Shall not murder. Don't kill. We take this spiritual law very seriously. We take this to the voting booth. We support women's clinic to help a woman who is in distress to make a better decision to choose life. Don't commit adultery. It's the marriage law. Sex is sacred. To God, it's between one man and one woman. It's not something that when a man gets angry and just move on to the next person or find any other reason to move on to the next woman. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor and don't uh, covet. Those are the non-negotiable in the laws of God. So what happened if you marry a woman that's been divorced? Does that mean you're causing her to commit adultery? Right? That's, that's the big question. Right? Like, where do we go? What do we do from here? Do, am I committing adultery? Is, am I causing her to commit adultery? Listen here, guys. The law for God is first and foremost to protect the union of marriage. So that means if you're thinking about getting married or you are in a marital situation right now, know how serious that bond is and use it to worship God not to use and abuse her. And if you are going to marry a divorced woman or someone who has been in a broken relationship, we are now participating in breaking the marriage law, the original law that God intended for us to follow. But here's the beauty of it. We were bought with the price. 
Here's the beauty of how God heals our sinful nature and our broken relationships. We were bought with the price. The hardest question, the hardest conversation I had with Liz before we got married, that I had detested the, the, the bed of intimacy before I married her. She was pure as they come, but I wasn't. I wasn't a Christian. But the beauty of the church, the beauty of Christ, is that we were bought with the price. Because what was instituted by law in the Ten Commandments, we all has broken that. We worship other gods. We steal. We cheat. We commit adultery. So what did God do? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, you were bought at a price. Not, do not become slaves or human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person has responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. What's he saying? He's saying whatever situations you're in right now, the mistakes are already made. We already violated God's law somehow, all of us. We all fall short. We all fall short and, and are sinful in the eyes of God. But whatever we find ourselves in right now, we, God and Paul is asking us to honor God, whatever the situations is that you are in right now. The divorce rate in America is 42%. 60% of divorce are reasons is, is infidelity and, and, and finance. It's 60% infidelity and finance. Other common reasons for divorce in America is lack of family support, lack of intimacy, too much conflict, and financial stress. Notice that because I'm angry, because she doesn't do the things she used to do anymore, she gained a little weight, or, or, or not the way I found her when we dated. Lack of family support, lack of intimacy, too much conflict, and financial stress. A one-hour marriage counseling session is 150 bucks to 200 Some couples come to my office, and they said, we should have went to you a long time ago instead of paying 500 bucks a session. By the way, I'm free. I'm available. Come and pray and talk. And here's the beauty of what I do as your pastor and do marital counseling. I don't want you to come back. <laughs> I don't have a 10-session plan out so I can meet my paycheck every month to pay for the office. I want to solve your problem as quickly as possible. I'm going to tell you the truth up front from day one. There's an old, I think it was Saturday Night Live skit. He, he had a sign on his desk. Solve every problem in five minutes. So the guy comes into the office and just starts spilling out every single issues they have and just talking, oh, it is, and that, blah, blah, blah. And after five minutes, he shuts off the clock, and he says, get over it. Be on your way. <laughs> get over it. Be on your way. <laughs> I share these statistics Not to say that the world can't solve our deep spiritual issue that comes from here. We're, we're, we are so spiritually broken that God made a law for it. Don't commit adultery. But what the law can't do, God sent his son, Jesus, to die for us for what the law has powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. The picture of Jesus on the cross takes away the mistakes that you have ever made. Ever. Past, present, and future. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. My job today is not to give you marriage advice. 
But I do want to remind you this. What difference does this make? Whatever situations you're in now, I want to remind you that you are Christ's followers. You have, been, you have been forgiven by God. So use your new life to honor God. Use your new life to honor God. Whatever mistakes you made in the past, how do I honor God now? I was angry. I was this. I was that. Maybe I can change these things because that didn't work out in the past. But maybe I'm a, I'm a new creation. I'm a new life. I've been bought with a price. How can I do that now and do it right? You know, I'm working on this series for, for, for marriage. You're going to enjoy it. I'm, I'm really excited. And uh, <laughs> I discovered that the men and women are not as mysterious as they say, right? Uh, Thanks to the internet. I can Google anything and find out about a woman. Just Google it. It's there. We can find answers. I can find worldly advice. And we all know in this room that men and women are completely different. Agree? I can only speak on the guy's perspective. You're going to hear from Liz and I and maybe some other couples as well during the series in October about marriage. But I would say this. From a guy perspective, we have boxes for everything, right? We have a kid box. Spend time with the kids. And we have our own kid box. Do the things that we used to do when we were 12-year-olds. Swinging on trees and just go out and break things. We have box for work. We have box for finances. We have box of for intimacy. By the way, that is the biggest box in our brain, by the way, ladies. The biggest box is the box of intimacy, just so you know, all right? And then we have a nothing box. You know, guys, who has a nothing box? What are you thinking? Nothing. <laughs> I ain't thinking nothing. <laughs> it's true. We would sit there and think nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. I'm th nothing. <laughs> Just accept that there's nothing. We have a nothing box. For women, it's, well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> right. <laughs> we argue. <laughs> you know, we, men like to bring out this particular box to argue about. What you, you know, how you mess that up. And that's all we want to talk about. We don't want to talk about how we messed up 10 years ago. And that annoys her. You girl, ladies, you know this because uh, it takes you a while to untangle your emotions. To get, and the guys get real impatient. Like, well, I heard that before, you know, those things. Which subject do you want to tackle first, right? Everything is interconnected for women. But what I do discover this is that what leads to infidelity is not always physical. It's, it's, it's often emotional conflict, an unresolved conflict between a man and a woman, as you will. You are created completely different. And conflict grows to anger. Anger grows to resentment. And in that moment of resentment, two people decided that they are not going to honor Christ. And that's what leads to infidelity. In the moment of conflict comes about anger. Anger comes about resentment. Resentment, it's an emotional roller coaster. The two people decided, not, I'm not going to honor you the way God told me to. So that leads to infidelity. Again, we will cover that more in October. But for today, I want to remind you this, that you are a Christ follower. As the band come forward. You've been given communion.
if you don't have communion, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll, we'll give you one. I want to remind you that you are Christ's follower. We say this often in a marriage ceremony, in a wedding ceremony, to emulate Jesus' life in our relationship, to serve one another and ask the Holy Spirit for help. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as of Christ Jesus. Have this, in in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset that of Christ Jesus. I want to ask our elders to come up. Go ahead, Brennan and Junie on this side and Joe and Susan on this side. I'm going to have Arrow and Audrey come up too. Go ahead and make make your way up, guys. Um, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Fight. Fight for your marriage. Fight for that relationship. You put up the good fight. You do whatever you can in your control to fight. And that's the most spiritual thing you can do as a Christian. Marriage is a steeple of the community, a stronghold of a relationship, a a marriage in in God. It is the picture of what the world is missing, a picture of what every kid who goes home to a single mom or single dad looks forward to I want to share you something personal I became a Christian because this one family Jay and David Tracy when we were in Italy she came down and watched our children for us so we can be in Italy. What I wanted so bad in life was that picture of family. David would come home and we'd be with his children and Jay is willing to do anything for her kids. Dinner was always there. I can come to the house anytime. The door was always open. I wanted that family. And that's why you see me so passionate about being a dad. And I discovered, I didn't know what Christianity was, and I found out they were Christians. Like, what does that mean? So I went to church with them. And I began to learn about what God has in store for us in the Ten Commandments, how to follow it, how to love it. Now I'm learning how to love my wife. Do we have issues? Yes, we do. As your pastor, we have issues. We have issues just like all of We have intimacy issues. We have communication issues. We have finance issues. We have kids' issues. We have our free time issues. And she has the nothing box with me issues. What are you doing? Nothing. What do you mean? Nothing. but fight. You apologize. Guys, you know when you're wrong. You know when your pride kicks in and said, take a walk. Write it down. And you love her. You protect her. You honor her. Because God told you so. Because you are a Christian. Amen. And if you have been through that relationship, Here's even a more important message for you. You have been bought and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what God cares about. He doesn't care about your last relationships. He cares about the one you're in now and how you're going to move forward. Because you've been bought. We all have failed the law. That's why Jesus died. 